recording is started. If you don't want your name or face shown, change your name. Um, that's my quick, simple response to that. Um, all right, everybody. Recording has started. Um, so what do people want to hear me rant about? Um, I see Johannes has uh, raised their hand. Go ahead, Johannes. So I'm doing a little uh, informal poll of people in the know. So we have a um, all sorts of protocols and networks emerging here all of a sudden. Um, there is the activity pub sort of strand. There is the web mention strand. There's the blue sky strand, the web five strand, and all sorts of things. And all of them broadly are, you know, fairly worse kind of stuff. But of course, none of them talk to each other unless you go through some kind of converter. Uh, wait, it's really wait, wait. Difficult they talk to, to each other with ActivityPub. That was the whole point. So, so, say again? I, I they talk the to each part. other with ActivityPub. Many of them talk to each other with ActivityPub. That was the whole point. Well, so I, I understand this was the, the whole point, but practically today, and then my question goes to this, um, if you go out to somebody and says, you should really adopt this decentralized Fediverse thingy, what do you tell them to adopt? Because ah. they can't adopt all of them. And what what makes it for them a safe decision to do that so that not some other protocol all of a sudden takes over? And this is sort of a rant question because, of course, nobody can predict the future here. But I want to hear opinions. <clears throat> I can only respond insofar as what the goals of uh, um, what I've done previously and what I'm doing today um, are, I think. Uh, and the... So as in terms of, so the activity pub was born out of frustration, you know, so, so I guess uh, the rant topic number one, which is, you know, what's safe to recommend for interop. Um, so activity pub was born out of this very frustration with this moment, right? We had, um, yeah, at the time that activity pub started, there were a bunch of different implementations of um, decentralized social network pro uh, protocols in social network applications, and they couldn't talk to each other, right? So if you were around back at the diaspora, status net, et cetera, days. Um, and OStatus was kind of the closest we had to that, but it was not really that broadly interoperable. So um, ActivityPub was the effort of the time to try to um, to try to, to bridge interoperability. I think we've been pretty successful in that we've had the most interoperability of any decentralized social networking protocol that's existed, I think, on the web. Right? That's not true as in terms of email. You could say email is the most de uh, broad decentralized networking protocol uh, for communication. But and, and in terms of web-based protocols, I think that's true. Um, now, you, you may notice that my focus these days is not on ActivityPub as a core. Um, and um, actually, if you look at, um, so we, our new home on the web is Sprightly.Institute. A little bit more boring looking than our former home on the web, but it's a little bit more professional looking. Here's our older one, uh, sprightlyproject.org, right? Has this character saying, hey, go over to the other one, right? Um, and there are, this was kind of a more bold website in some ways. It says social worlds await, kind of almost looks like it's going to be video gamey. There's this monster manual of creatures down here that said it describes all the different layers of the stuff we we're going to attack. Um, and it used to be that actually this page would say, um, it said that this is builds on our experience from co-authoring ActivityPub, right? And um, ActivityPub is mentioned one other place, which is you know easy ActivityPub integration. There's this layer here called Mandy. Um, nonetheless, it's not where our main focus is right now. Our main focus is not on ActivityPub. If you see my other talks, you heard me talk about goblins. We heard me talk about OCAPN, the Object Capability Network, um, and we're going to be bridging back to that. Um, I don't know how to make safe bets other than to try to build them. Um, ActivityPub was an attempt to try to build a safe bet um, shared protocol that did the kinds of things that we were doing uh, that we saw social networks applications doing um, over the last decade and a half, you know? Uh, the kind of stuff that Twitter was doing, the kind of stuff that Facebook was doing, et cetera, et cetera. I think it succeeded pretty well at that. Um, Sprightly started as in terms of what can't we do, right? And, it, and one of the things that I was weird about this is I chose Social Worlds Await, and I kind of made it look video gamey intentionally. And we've completely clawed that back with the Sprightly Network Communities Institute in many ways. 
But there was a reason for that. And part of the reason we clawed it back is that the this is before Metaverse took off as a concept, right? I, I seemed, at the time that I was doing this, I had a really hard time convincing anybody to take me seriously that I was pushing the virtual world's direction. Um, because, you know, like, this seems like a waste of time. Now, I'm trying to be like, oh, don't associate us with, like, Meta and all those other places that think they're building the Metaverse, right? Um, the reason for this was that, um, of, and, and this is completely misunderstood by stuff like, uh, Facebook and Meta being like, oh yeah, you know, they're, they're focused on goggles and gloves, right? They're focused on these very, uh, surface level versions of things. But for me, you know, the scenario I thought of was, okay, Alice and Carol want to meet at a bar in a virtual, this distributed virtual world. And they're going to um, communicate securely ahead of time that they're going to meet up at this bar. They're going to meet up at the bar. They're going to sit at the table. Um, only people who are sitting at the table should be able to hear each other. When Alice, Carol says to Alice, gosh, I'm thirsty. Alice walks up to the bar. Alice talks to bar, Bob the bartender, buys a drink, carries it back to the, um, the bar without anybody stealing it. And Carol drinks it and gets dizzy. Now, if you think about this, this is a pretty ordinary circumstance, you know, in our daily life, but it involves a whole bunch of interesting components. It involves uh, decentralized identity. If we're, if, we're, if we're saying all of these components are decentralized, you know, you say, okay, try to imagine building this thing, and now try to imagine building it fully distributed. Um, it requires decentralized identity. It requires real-time, live, active interactions and communications. It requires, um, you know, locational based systems, including locationally based, uh, with the capability to be able to participate in a conversation when you're only present within a particular um, kind of virtual space. It requires um, the ability to have object transfer. It requires money. It requires, um, it, and it requires an encry encryption for the communication of the participants uh, agreeing to meet up at the bar. Um, and the weirdest thing of all is that it also involves object transfer, but it also involves object consumption. And there's a weird effect that happens where Carol drinks the drink and gets dizzy, and in consensually is getting dizzy, and this does not want anybody to just wave a, a, a wand at her and get allow her to get whizzy at any dizzy at any time. This is a, an effect that she's opting into. Um, so uh, a side note here: uh, before we founded the Sprightly Institute, I actually was probably I think number two in the running for Blue Sky. Um, and I, uh, I didn't get it, and uh, I did have some conversations about whether or not I should work there afterwards. Um, but the, but one of the things that I, I told them this whole scenario, and I said, you know, imagine trying to build this. Now imagine saying, and there's no central authority, and all of these objects live on a different server. Alice lives on a different server. Carol lives on a different server. Bob the bartender, the bar, everything, everything lives on a different server. Um, how much can, would it can cost? Can I add me? one more thing to that? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so I so I'm, I'm totally with you on this scenario. Um, I think there's one more uh, complications. If it is 3D space of some kind, we now have to do uh, things like um, uh, geometry matching, uh, as uh -huh. in non-overlaps, right? We, we have to actually be able to touch each other and not walk through each other. That's right. And that is, that version of integration in a decentralized fashion is a rather interesting problem. And I haven't actually even heard of anybody really talking about that. Aha, uh -huh. there's a <laughs> wonderful paper. You're going to like it. I'm going to link it in the chat. OK. <laughs> uh, but, it's so, called so, Object but, Capability, no, is... Security and Virtual Environments. It shows how to build one of these things using OCAP, and, uh, OCAP tools. I read this paper and I'm like, shit, huh. I'm able to do Sprightly. It's possible. All the ideas are there. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, they involve the, you know, you can only touch things within your, in certain proximities of things and stuff like that. And they show how to do can, it. Um, can you drop that URL into the, into the chat or into the I notes? did. I did. It's in the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Uh, um, so, so, so what, when I, when I, when I pitched this to Blue Sky, they, um, one of the, so I'm dropping some, some background lore, but who cares? Jack and uh, Prague no longer work there. So am I going to get in trouble for this? Probably not. Uh, the, um, so I, I had a, um, uh, I, I, in the middle of this presentation, Prague asked me, well, why all the virtual world stuff? This seems weird and out there. And, you know, MetaMask had not rebranded the Vena, Meta, none of that stuff had done yet. And so I said, um, well, and I tried to explain it and I kind of failed. And then I wrote, woke up in the middle of the night, typed up a long email with like all of that explanation and sent it off to um, the CEO and CTO at Twitter at three in the morning in like a cold sweat. And then I went back to bed and I'm like, what the fuck have I done? And then uh, um, I woke up in the morning and uh, they had both responded with, this is awesome. And I was like, Whew. Uh, so um, the, the, but what, what they, they said was what was compelling about that was that um, you said that you know, the goal was not to make the virtual worlds. The goal was to have a, 
um, that trying to build distributed virtual worlds gives you all the right metrics that you need to hit to be able to build all the right components. Because once you can do that, you can do everything else, right? Um, so this is, um, so one of the reasons that Sprightly started is I, I, I took that scenario and I said, how do I build stuff that's capable of doing all this? The goal, again, is not to build video games and stuff like that, though I love it. And, you know, you saw Dave show off a video gaming type thing and stuff like that. The goal is, is that it's a good metaphor, right? You know, Virtual Worlds, um, Chip Morningstar, when we when I had a call with him, he, he was Randy Farmer's, like, co-founder of a bunch of different organizations. And in these spaces and he he said to us on the call well the thing about virtual worlds is that they tend to be most interesting to the people who make the virtual worlds rather than anybody who's trying to use them um and uh and he said but they're the right metaphor to force you to solve all the right problems and i think that he's completely right so you see um so that that shows why meta just completely missed the mark just whoosh, way over the head right because they focused on this thing that they're trying to deliver that's like the the cool like 3d you want to live in this thing Psh. You know, if you can make a text-based version of all these things, building the 3D stuff on top of right. it is actually the easy part. But you can hire any game development company to do that for you these days. The hard part is the authority model, right? The hard part is all the collaboration tools. That's the hard part. And they didn't try to solve any of that in their system, right? So when yeah. we moved from yeah. here to here, it was to try to make ourselves look prof more professional and less like a confusing Dungeons and Dragons monster manual. But that the influence <laughs> of all that still sits behind a, a bunch of the stuff in Sprightly. So, so I uh, actually I totally agree with you on the on the take here um, uh, on the the virtual world part. Uh, all of this, uh, I wasn't expecting this conversation uh, this conversation to go there, uh, and it is sort of uncommon in what you what you outlined there. Is it's not commonly thought of um when people think about metaversity like kind of thingies and i um, completely agree that facebook completely missed the boat somehow uh, they're just throwing money at it without thinking what they're actually doing somehow <laughs> i don't know um but i'm with you um yep we should uh, actually maybe compare some notes and uh, some other time yep cool <clears throat> um so so the reason i brought this up was you were asking about what protocols can you bet on Right, so this is the partly me trying to answer why did we start doing a new thing, right? When, and and we have this thing of oh well we'll have a, a way to do integration with ActivityPub, but we're focusing on all these new things that are not necessarily ActivityPub, and part of the problem that I ran into when we when I did OCAP Pub, which with me trying to desperately explain to the Fediverse oh shit we're gonna break everything and we're gonna have all these problems that we are having now today, in fact. Um, which is, you know, that spam and harassment and anti-abuse stuff was not going to be implemented correctly um, in the whitelist, blacklist approach, or allow list, deny list, I should say, um, in that uh, it leads to this thing I call the uh, nation statification of the Fediverse. Um, and that that's what you see all the, all the time, right? How much of your timeline on the Fediverse is filled up with quote-unquote feta drama? Probably quite a bit. Um, mine certainly is. And uh, a, a lot of that's because there's all these communities that have different needs. But like, if you imagine, you know, having code of conduct and having having rules for your site makes tons of sense, right? You know, every forum I've ever participated in, whether it's like old school PHP forums or whatever, they all had rules about what you, it's allowed and what's not allowed, right? But, you know, imagine that you have an epilepsy support group and then you've got a like, you know, vaporwave demo scene group. Those two groups have completely different needs especially as in terms of flashing images and so on and so forth. You know, you try wiring these two things together, you're going to end up in pain, right? You know, um, uh, I have, um, and so the the expectations are contextual. Um, so there's there's a bunch of things I tried to explain in here about like, okay, here's a different way of being able to do, um, uh, you know, security and authentication and authorization using OCAPs. And at the time I started working on this, the main response I got was, well, we're developing a Rails app. We have no idea how the hell to implement any of these things you're talking about. This isn't how we do things. We do an SQL query against, you know, who we think has access to what. This this vision of things basically being like actors and stuff like that. And so I just kind of threw up my hands and I said, all right, this is not what I should be focusing my time on. Um, I should be focusing my time on building something where it's easy and obvious to build the right things correctly, which I was already doing. I was writing up OCAP Pub as a diversion, as a desperate attempt to try to explain things. So looping back around to Activity Pub is partly happening because we want to be able to get the things working right in the kind of environment where programming this stuff is really easy, which is what Goblins gives you, right? Goblins gives you the ability to trivially build peer-to-peer -peer network collaborative applications, whereas normally uh, building peer-to-peer -peer network applications is incredibly difficult. Um, 
So there's uh, um, Diana slash Garbados wrote up this wonderful article called The Conceptual Introduction to Sprightly Goblins. I really recommend reading it. And she has this line in here, which is, you know, um, uh, the, you know, she basically says, like, you know, like, I, look, I built this distributed uh, encrypted storage system on top of goblins and I did it in two evenings and it would have taken me two years to do it on top of any other system. And that's because, you know, like the, it's just, once you start using this type of thing, it's hard to imagine building a peer-to-peer -peer application any other way. Um, so I see Blaine is in the chat. Uh, you know, the Fission is also doing OCAP type things. Uh, I, I'm, um, I, I'm glad that OCAPs are spreading. We need to get, uh, we need to get more organizations though in the programming language version of, uh, of OCAPs where users never touch things like you can and stuff like that. Those just happen invisibly under the hood because I think that having programming language with distributed programming uh, abstractions, which, which Fission I think does support to a large degree with the work that they're doing on the storage side of things. Um, so I think we actually need the encrypted storage stuff with OCAPs and the encrypted programming language stuff with OCAPs to compose together. But the abstractions should be that such that it only feels like doing ordinary programming. Users don't feel like they're actually touching a, a, a capability or security layer. It just feels like they're doing ordinary programming and passing around ordinary arguments. See Blaine typing. Um, uh, um, Blaine, you can actually just talk if you want to. You don't have to. You can do whatever you want. Do that. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, with some of the IPVM stuff and and some of the uh, sort of you can invocation stuff that Brooke is working on right now, um, uh, it it basically like I think the experience of using something like IPVM, which is distributed Wasm, uh, is is going to like hopefully the goal is to is to make it that, that where you you basically you can't do stuff that you don't have permission to, but you don't have to think about. The right. actual tokens it's just and it's brooke, part of the system brooke yeah. has been participating in ocapen the ocapen uh uh um the ocapen uh okay. uh like kind of pre-standards group that we have right now so that's been great um, i'm hoping to get and and i know is interested in trying to get that as being some of the network layer to connect together these different things speaking of WebAssembly, um let's go back to sprightly.institute again did you all hear about this guile on WebAssembly project underway Direct compilation of Guile to WebAssembly. Uh, no using mscript to compile the VM or whatever, just direct program compilation straight to WebAssembly. This is the big thing that we just announced recently. I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, this is just a, a series of one rant after the other. This is the end of the conference. You're getting Christine in a frazzled state, just rambling about thing to thing. This is one of the other things that's on my mind, and therefore I'm very liable to rant about. Um, but where do you want to go from here? What's the, What remaining things do you want within the remaining time you have of rants? We have 18 have, minutes have of you, rants have left. You figured out how to, how do, have you figured out how to call uh, um, do typed invocation of Wasm? <laughs> typed invocation of Wasm? Um, or like, like invocation of Wasm with complex types. I don't know what you mean. Across, across boundaries, like if you want to call a Wasm function. Oh, um, um, with, doing type with, things. Without using tons of, like, without Imscript, uh, without the, the macros and everything. Um, so, I mean, this is the, uh, we're not, we're not doing, uh, uh, so we're, we're not using Imscript at all. We're going to be doing direct compilation straight to WebAssembly um, from Scheme, just straight Scheme translations to WebAssembly. Um, so the, the types conversions and stuff like that, one of the positions we actually have open is that some of the base types, um, so we're going to be able to use a numeric tower. There's actually a WebAssembly extension that's in, uh, that's in process that looks like it's going to be probably land probably in 2024 that allows you to be able to use the same kind of numeric tower that you have in the browser and in, in JavaScript inside of, um, maybe even cleave it up a little bit, inside of uh, WebAssembly. Uh, we'll probably be able to use that, which will actually reduce... Um, Oh, I support. And yes, WASM tail. So actually, with the person that we have brought on board, I'm allowed to say it here, even though we haven't put it in the post yet, because they're about to put out their own post. Uh, we're hiring uh, Andy Wingo, who is the um, who's the lead developer of Guile, but also is, um, or we're contracting them through their organization, Egalia, but also does a whole bunch of implementation of a bunch of really cool features that exist in both, um, bo across, you know, both, major JavaScript browser engines, uh, including the WebAssembly stuff. And um, and so they're kind of being our guide and getting this stuff. We also are hiring a person to do scheme to WebAssembly stuff that's going to be working alongside them, reports to me, the CTO. 
Um, the uh, um, and one of the big things, uh, Dave was there for that meeting. So we had this meeting with uh, Andy, and it was like we're trying to hammer out: is this feasible, right? You know, do we have to do the terrible thing where we just compile the VM with M script in, or can we do what we actually want to do, where we can actually do direct compilation? And um, it turned out when it came to the point where I said, well, you can use all the extensions that you think are going to land within like a year or a year and a half. Uh, that opened up everything. So the WASM GC proposal means that we don't have to implement. Um, um, yes, it does feel like the A language itself is getting on board. Yes, having Andy is going to be freaking huge. It raises our confidence dramatically. Um, and so uh, the so having uh, the so the, the, we're able to use the WebAssembly GC proposal, which will mean that um, we can do direct compilation. Uh, we don't have to compile a, a GC or anything like that or add that. You can actually use the same one that the native environment provides, which also allows you to have access to the same heap, which means that garbage collection across the processes becomes dramatically easier. I think that's going to be a big feature. Um, one of the other ones is the tail call elimination proposal. Another one is a multiple value return proposal. And I don't think it's going to be in in time, but if it, once it gets in, we'll be able to take advantage of the delimited continuation proposal. And so all of those proposals should be able to make the feasibility of this uh, shoot up dramatically. Uh, right now, I think there's this impression that WebAssembly is like a thing that C and Rust programmers get to use and the rest of the world can't. Well, let me tell you, I like to hand code WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a fun language to program in. And uh, have you ever looked at WASM4? Really recommend it. It's fun. It's a fantasy console. Uh, that allows you to program. Uh, you can program it in WebAssembly by hand, but you can also program it in uh, um, in uh, on top of. Uh, so it's and it's incredibly limited, right? You only have 160 by 160 pixels, four customizable co colors. If you saw this this logo that I did for the this conference with this little cute witch character, that's because I've been playing around with uh, um, doing four color graphics, uh, partly in anticipation of this. Um, you know, you've only got, so you've got a very limited memory, mouse memory storage and stuff like that. So you're really kind of using this to the max. Now you can program this on top of Rust or C and compile to WASM4, but you can also just program it by hand. Um, and there is a, a bunch of really fun games that people have made. Um, there is even a Neon Cat demo, which plays the Neon Cat music. Um, highly recommend it. I'll link it in the chat so everybody can hear this glorious music right now instead of listening to me talk. Um... But, you know, they've got uh, uh, other little things like, um, where is the, they've got some nice 3D ones. Wow, look at this one. This one's wild. Um, let's see if I can, yeah. Uh, this one's a flight simulator. Somebody managed to program. And I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, but you can see it's possible to program these types of things, and I'm probably going to crash. I don't think I actually accelerated correctly. Bam. <laughs> but, uh, um, but you know, it's it's fun to have things where you're really forced to go at a low level. But what I'm interested in is that what we're going to be doing on top of our stuff is um, uh, we're going to be compiling directly to WebAssembly, which means that you um, there's no need to carry around the whole VM and et cetera, et cetera, which I think I've said about three times now, so I can shut up about that. Um, and yeah, uh, what, what else, what else should I rant about? I've been going from one thing to another. Anybody want to I'll just say that the, um, the, the direct compilation for WebAssembly is actually going to, uh, enable direct comp direct native compilation for Guile in the future. Like it's going to be, um, moving up, moving Guile in that direction, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, instead of just compiling WebAssembly, yeah, yeah. So, let me expand on that phrase, direct native compilation. So, like, in other words, compiling Guile directly into an execution, uh, executable, right? You won't need the whole VM and stuff like that. You'll be able to compile your scheme program, and it'll just produce a native executable that you can run on the host machine. Uh, so, yeah, we're very excited about all that. Um, so, yeah, that'll be a future thing, but yeah, it's like it's we're moving in the right direction by the by doing this WebAssembly project. So, so let me see another thing that's enabled by it. Uh, right now, if you um, right now part of the goal of this also is not just advancing sprightly stuff, but advancing the WebAssembly ecosystem in general. Right now, since it is kind of like oh well, WebAssembly is a toy for 
um, C and web, web, sorry, C and Rust developers, right? People who write low-level languages to compile their programs to. But I really just want WebAssembly to be the thing that uh, that makes it so that JavaScript is not the dominant, like, you know, JavaScript's the language of the web. Everything's the language of the web. And that includes dynamic languages in general. So that um, you could, you should be able to write your, any programming language should be able to be just as much of an equal player on the web without having to carry around a huge executable that needs to boot up or whatever. Uh, though I'll ha I have to say, it's surprising how little, I don't know, if you've ever looked at uh, webassembly.sh, this is fun. Um, cow say, hello, decent social. Now it says it's fetching it. Just fetch the Unix command uh, um, with, compiled with uh, WebAssembly, the WebAssembly interface, so that you can do this. Okay, cow say, OMG, I can't believe it. And pipe it to lolcat. It's going to, and, oop. Oh, sorry. Cow say, OMG, OMG, lolcat. All right, fetches it. It does that. Uh, let's do it again. Better colors, right? Uh, um, so the, the cool thing here is that this is actually, there is something called WASI. Uh, I think it's WASI.net. Wait, was that right? Uh, nope. Uh, WASI. I'm going to do a search on DuckDuckGo. Hold up. Oh, that's not it. Wow. What? DuckDuckGo's results, results, not the best always. So that what's kind of wild about WASI is it's basically like, POSIX for WebAssembly, right? Um, except that it opens in a sandbox that's, you know, OCAP-ish and that it doesn't have access to particularly interesting things until you pass it in. So what this also means is that in this this demo here, I can type uh, Python. It goes and downloads Python and it executes it. And I'm gonna do uh, three plus three. And I'm gonna do print hello world. And then it'll just keep giving me these shitty prompts until I press cancel. And then you see it executed it right here. Python dash help. Um, so, but what's weird is that this is, you know, this is not taking that long to boot up. So even if you do an M scripting compilation of a dynamic language, it's pretty fast for a lot of these things. Web, WebAssembly is getting kind of wild. Um, so anyway, I'm pretty excited about all that stuff. Uh, yeah. So next, next rant topic. We've got eight minutes of rants left. What else do you want to hear me rant about? Nuts. Uh, okay, that's the that's the troll. Yes, I got an orchiectomy yesterday. Do you want me to rant about getting an orchiectomy and about gender dysphoria and uh, uh, transitioning? I can. And then you're fun. Only if you're comfortable. Uh, but I, I'm, yeah, it's fun. It's exciting. Sure, I'm happy to talk about my experiences transitioning. So I, I am a transgender woman. I transitioned, I started transitioning about a year and a half ago publicly. I identified as non-binary a long time before that, kind of came out as non-binary a year before I came out as trans feminine. Um, uh, it's been great. It's been pretty much the best thing uh, I've ever done for my self-confidence, for my happiness, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the only other decisions that have been as comparatively great have been um, uh, getting into a relationship with my wonderful long-term partner and wife, uh, Morgan, who's amazing. And uh, I think also the career that I've, I've chosen and have executed on. Other than that, uh, transitioning has made an enormous difference. I've moved from not being able to look myself in the mirror, uh, which I was not able to do since puberty, to um, actually be uh, becoming a, a stereotype who takes tons and tons of selfies all the time, right? Um, and it's great. It's amazing having that, that level of difference uh, in my life. And uh, um, so transitioning, there's a whole lot of different ways that you can choose to go about things. Um, I uh, have, um, so I'm on hormone replacement therapy. It's been great, um, except that spirolactone sucks. That, so in order for, for a, um, for a uh, let's say, moving from a masculine body shape to a feminine body shape, uh, which is not fully accurate in my case, because I'm pretty sure I'm intersex in some ways. That's a topic. For, um, uh, uh, I'll just talk about it. If I'm going to talk about these things, I might as well talk about them. Um, I actually uh, experienced uh, um, 
since puberty, uh, spontaneous lactation for the uh, on a reasonable amount of basis, and had more breast tissue even when tissue when skinny than was normal, and found out that this has happened with a number of other people in my family. Um, so I think I might be intersex, but I'm not sure. Uh, I uh, and I so so even saying moving from a male body is not necessarily correct, right? Um, so uh, and you know, the, there's the terms like gender uh, assigned male at birth and stuff like that. None of these feel particularly great. But they're kind of ter the terms we have. But moving from a AMAB body, as I guess people would say, to um, a, a more uh, feminine shape uh, has been a bunch of different steps. I think hormones have helped a lot. For me, one of the biggest things was stopping the effects of testosterone, um, particularly the enormous amount of anxiety that I had about losing uh, my hair as the more I was on testosterone. Uh, and, uh, cause that's basically testosterone is that what, what does that to your body? Um, and, uh, and, uh, when you're going on hormone replacement therapy, initially I was like, maybe I'll just, just go on anti-androgens to remove my hair and I don't, and then I'll go on, uh, uh, estrogen. Well, it turns out you don't want to do that because what that does is it leads you to menopause, uh, an early menopause in life. And you don't want to go on menopause any, any earlier than a person would normally go through it. Um, so, uh, and it turned out that estrogen has actually been pretty great. So I use patches to apply estrogen. There are other routes that you can take. Um, I had to fight with my insurance for about a year and a half almost to get my orchiectomy. It probably reduced a significant amount of time in my life because I had to stop taking blood pressure medication. That's very important to me because I couldn't take it at the same time as spider lactone. And it was during a very stressful year of my life while we were starting the Spritely Institute. So it actually created some serious problems where I started having like uh, momentary vision loss and stuff like that um, because I was not able to get my orchiectomy and be able to be on the medication that I actually needed. There are other paths that you can take where you don't have to take spirulactone, which is a testosterone blocker, um, such as um, doing high injections of estrogen. They have their own risks. It can be increased risk of cancer and et cetera, whereas patches are fairly comparatively safe. Um, so I... And it just was a lot of effort to be able to get on uh, that in general. Um, so an orchiectomy uh, is basically removing, it's basically removing your testicles. Uh, so um, I had one yesterday. And so that is the reason why I was not expecting to present at this conference, even though I've done a bunch of presentations at this conference. And uh, uh, it's been great. Uh, I had a vasectomy previously in life, and that was very painful to recover from. This has not been very painful to recover from. And I guess that the reason for that is that the vasectomy involved a lot of testicular swelling, and now I no longer have testes. So, you know, it turned out to be much easier of a recovery than I was expecting. Uh, it's already been really great for my mental health. It's much more comfortable to cross my legs. It, I don't have to be on spiralactone anymore. Um, it's just one less thing to worry about. Uh, orchiectomies are very safe, very easy to perform. They are... Um, they are one there i have decided to not go at least not for the time being in my life to a full uh gender genital reconstructive surgery the other material works fine in a sexual capacity for my needs and interests and i'm not interested in um, doing that level of thing because i have a lot of hypochondria and i think i would be too anxious about the complication potential complications i have plenty of friends who have had it and have uh, either had amazing results or some difficulties, and I'm just not willing to, 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 to roll that dice on that. Um, so anyway, I'm very happy with it. it I wish that the, um, my main commentary on all this stuff is if you are considering exploring these types of things, uh, the best time to do it would have been yesterday, um, and today is the second best time to do it. And um, there's been nothing that's made me happier. Uh, and if you ever want to talk about such things, uh, I don't have time to talk to everybody. But I might have time to talk to you to some degree, but I might be able to point you at some resources. If we're a close friend of mine, I'm certainly always happy to talk. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, that's my, uh, that's my ramble on losing my balls and other such things. So there you go. Was that sufficient, Blaine? <laughs> I was going to type, but I'll just speak. Thanks for sharing. That was lovely. I'm really glad that you're that you're uh, feeling great. That's awesome. Thanks. I'm really happy too. And now, we'll finish off with that. There we go. 
All right. I think we are at the end. We have definitely, definitely jumped the shark or the cow in this particular case. Um, jump the Ikea shark? I don't know. I don't have one of those. Everybody else does who's trans, apparently, but not me. I'm not going to shill for Ikea, not on my watch. Anyway, that's it. That's, under the, that's end the end of the set of rants. I hope you all have enjoyed this conference, and I guess I'll see you over for the closing circle. Bye, everybody.